Okay, hi. Uh, Ryan John King, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, you're, you're very welcome. I appreciate, uh, I appreciate you doing this. So um, we, we got in touch a while back uh, because you're, you're working on a new um, maps platform over IPFS and Ethereum, which I think is very interesting. So before, um, before we get into that, would you mind um, maybe just giving me a little bit about your background? Like, you know, what have you been working on before? What brought you to maps? Stuff like that. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> so my background is like formerly in economics and political science, and I was a scholar of the Middle East, uh, focusing actually at the time on like the Arab uprisings mm -hmm. from a spatial point of view. So protests and policing, policing patterns where people actually moving through the city and what kind of international developments like hotels or golf courses are maybe upsetting people. And mm -hmm. from that, I got interested in the actual architecture and design of cities. So I was doing uh, post-grad work in architecture uh, Columbia University, um, but given my background in economics and at the time uh, Bitcoin really, you know, making a lot of waves um, and also at the time being at post financial crisis, a lot of the discourse in architecture was on how can we uh, as architects take our own agency, start our own projects or have different financial models as opposed to just debt driven um, architecture. So we started conceptually bringing a lot of these blockchain ideas into different architecture projects and <clears throat> with my co-founder uh, and CTO, Christopher. He worked as a geometrist for Foster and Partners Architects based in London, like mm -hmm. one built the Apple campus. Um, but <clears throat> his background's in mathematics and my other co-founder, Katya, who's the chief creative officer, was an architect. Uh, but we're all pretty interested in blockchain and Christopher started uh, working on the Haskell Ethereum client. So he's a functional programmer developer. Um, <clears throat> and we won a competition to build an architecture project that was called Foam Space. Uh, in New York City in early 2015. So that was kind of like the crossover from my, you know, my background into full-time blockchain and I've been working full-time since then. Uh, that project was kind of an architecture installation of geofoam blocks uh, used in construction, but on the streets of New York City kind of to represent the blockchain. And there was a fest uh, block party that happened uh, that day, but we also gave out tokens to everyone who came to kind of capture the value and had a block sale where we sold the installation after and had this fund and a community and that was really the start of the foam space project. So I've been doing that for since 2015 full time. Very cool. So um, before we get into, you know, foam specifically, um, I'd kind of like to get your view of the landscape in terms of, of maps. You know, what, what in your view are the, uh, the limitations or the shortcomings of the incumbents, you know, like an Apple Maps or a Google Maps or an Open Street Maps? Yeah. Um, in, in terms of, you know, because cartography has been around for, you know, millennia, um, and now we have digital cartography, we have open resources, we even have open street maps. Um, so, why decentralize it? I mean, I understand that, that you know, there's, there's obviously censorship resistant um, features of, of, you know, all blockchain or distributed systems, but what, what, what is the problem that you, you view with the incumbents in the mapping space? Uh, great question. I'll tackle that in a moment, but just to take a step back, um, part of the initiative around foam was not necessarily to address issues in the web 2.0 mapping, but mm -hmm simply to bring geolocation tools into blockchain. So as a starting point, uh, tons of people are imagining use cases, whether they're in mobility or supply chain or a game. And we realized just off the bat, there's no way to even have a standard to encode geolocation in a blockchain, or how do we actually interact with geolocation uh, data on a blockchain visually. So that's kind of our starting point was trying to bring those tools to blockchain developers mm -hmm. uh, in the first place. But as it stands, there are a lot of issues with incumbents that this kind of uh, mechanism or direction can address. So some of the issues are, you know, Google Maps has, uh, without a doubt, the best data. Mm -hmm. And there's an amazing essay called Google Maps Moat and actually shows how they take different sets of proprietary data, for example, Google Street View and Google Satellites, and combine that to generate data sets called areas of interest. And that's this kind of... Um, beige shading you might see on a map that shows you that's probably where all the stores and activity is in an area. And this area of interest data set is built off of two other proprietary data sets. And so Google kind of has this moat where they can kind of 
accelerate their own data sets and how valuable they are based off their own proprietary data sets. So the problem with that is that it's extremely expensive to hook into Google Maps, and they actually have recently raised the price by a significant percent. I don't have the numbers in front of me. Um, so it's not an open system, and they have a lot of, sorry. Um, so that's one incumbent, and on the other side, you have the open source mapping, which is OpenStreetMap, uh, and that's a really great system. It has like over a million people contributing to it, mm -hmm. but there's no mechanism or incentive to check that data. And so what happens is that companies that want to use OpenStreetMap, like Mapbox, Foursquare, um, Craigslist even, Uber, they have to actually subsidize that verification process and pay their own human developers to manually check that data or develop AI algorithms um, so that they can't really actually use in a commercial setting OpenStreetMap data and they have to spend an enormous amount of money and time, what they call protecting the map from vandalism, mm -hmm. or spoofing and malicious behavior. Mm -hmm. And they're largely successful, but there's some large stories of recently things slipping by. For example, New York was renamed to Jewtropolis, and that made it all the way into all the Google, I mean, um, OpenStreetMap-based products via Mapbox. So that whether that's Snapchat, um, City Bikes in New York, the actual phone-based map, which uses Mapbox, was mm -hmm. changed from New York to Jewtropolis. So it's not a perfect system they have of protecting the map. And mm -hmm. that said, the data that they wind up generating via protecting it becomes proprietary and they turn around and sell it. So there isn't really this like very usable open data that is free, even though we have a lot of people contributing to it. Um, so in both cases, if you have an open source blockchain permissionless economy that mm -hmm. wants to reference geodata, one, you have an Oracle problem because you have to get that data off the chain. And then two, you don't know if that data has been verified properly. And three, you probably have to pay a centralized service for it. Um, so all of that we didn't see compatible with kind of a blockchain ecosystem and with the mechanism in our um, mapping protocol, we've introduced an incentive for people not only to add data, but also potentially check it for fraud. Um, so that's kind of on a high level of what's happening with the incumbents and why it's not really compatible with the direction Web3 is headed. Mm. One, one interesting question that I do have for you um, is, I mean, I, I, I definitely see the need for decentralized mapping and, and you know, uh, location verification and some kind of vandalism um, prevention or verification method, methods that would prevent, you know, issues like what you just described. But one, one question that immediately comes to mind is since browsers themselves are fundamentally open source, is there not an opportunity to scrape data from large incumbents? Uh, there's an opportunity. I would say most of them in their terms of service have something explicitly against scraping data, like for mm -hmm. example, Google Maps, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure how enforceable it would be to have you know, anonymous people scraping data. And, and so someone could develop an import tool where you take all these other data sets and bring it onto the blockchain and you put the associated stake you need to add that data, and then people can go back and check if it was accurate or not. Um, so there's definitely means of you know, importing data, probably hits on some questions around licensing and you know, if you're actually allowed to do that. Well, you know, again, in terms of allowed to, uh, I, I mean, I don't know. Um, I, I just, I, I feel like the data's there, right? It's definitely there. and. It's definitely, um, I mean, there's, there's no way, like, for example, in terms of intellectual property laws, there's no way that you can copyright facts, right? Like your name and your phone number is in the white pages, and those are just facts, and facts are not actually copyrightable. So when it comes to mapping data, I feel like if you're accurately reproducing just, you know, factually accurate information, um, and you're, you're stripping it of any proprietary details, uh, which, which you don't necessarily want anyway, right? There, there certainly is a, an opportunity to quickly expand the quality of your, of your data set by using, um, by, you know, maybe leveraging some of, some of the, the uh, incumbent data sets that already exist, right? So just maybe make me, making your phone maps more, uh, more complete um, very quickly. Is, is definitely an opportunity, an opportunity that, that, that I do want to point out because like I said, I mean, if, if the browser is open source, um, anything that's coming into your browser, you can, you can keep, right? It's, it's on your computer at that point. If, 
if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, I'm not sure to the details of how the browser and data in terms of service of other databases work, but in a high level, it's definitely possible to scrape data and do an import function and bring a lot of existing data into the map. You just uh, can't be sure if that data is corrupted or not. Right, obviously. Obviously, you still, and that's the major advantage of your system is that you're, you're trying to create some economic incentives to verify the data. Yeah, so to add data to the map, there's a minimum deposit of tokens. It's kind mm -hmm. of like an anti-spam mechanism. And you still own those tokens, but you're kind of attesting to the veracity of the data you're adding. Mm -hmm. and even if you're correct, you know, there's a latent bounty always there for someone to come back and check. So, and I myself added, you know, three different businesses in Brooklyn to the phone map that have actually closed since we launched them. And so okay. if someone else found that out before me, they actually have an incentive to, you know, flag that and potentially win the tokens that I had staked there. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. Cool. That's, that's, that's interesting. So there's definitely, there's definitely penalties for uh, potentially for even just allowing outdated data to, yeah. to persist. If you uh, yourself didn't know and come back and update it, well, then somebody's looking at the map and they're like, hey, I know that business closed. I'm going to start a challenge. Why would I do it? Because there's tokens locked up there I could win by helping to curate the map. Mm. Well, that's, that seems like a, almost like a little bit of a disincentive, right? For, for someone to add data, like let's say a tourist that, that just checks into some, some location um, that yeah. we have. Def definitely that there's an emphasis on adding as accurate data as you can. And mm -hmm. we have over 7,000 points on our map right now. Um, maybe 300 or so have actually been challenged off. And people are extremely diligent and cautious about adding that data because there's actually a value attached to the data that they're trying to add. So you can not be from that city and still add the data, but you should be pretty confident in the information you're adding. No, but I mean, like, shouldn't, you know, maybe um, considering something like, like time limits, right? So for example, if data is added and it's valid data and then it gets verified, right? Um, I, I shouldn't necessarily be penalized three years later if that business shuts down, right? Like I did, I did add valid data to, to, to the map. It was valid at the time. I mean, we, we might want to consider maybe um, having certain time limits or re-verification methods. But, but anyway, that's, that's maybe roadmap features, roadmap functionality. Uh, yeah, for sure. There's a lot um, of learnings that we've had from the way the map is launched so far. And we have an upgrade path with our smart contract registry. So there's been a lot learned from how challenges work, how metadata works. Um, and there's a lot of room to upgrade the registry and, you know, address these kind of edge cases in a different manner. Right. Um, so I want to talk about a, a little bit about the, the, the infrastructure that you're using as, as I understand. Um, so I got into contact with you over the, uh, the IPFS, um, GitHub newsletter. Um, so you, you, I guess you posted a, uh, a discussion topic there. So you're using IPFS, I gather, for, for hosting the, 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 the map data, and you're also using Ethereum, as I understand. Is that correct? Yeah, so the phone map is primarily an Ethereum web application, mm -hmm. um, and it's built on this tool called the Spatial Index, which is like mm -hmm. a full stack web app, essentially a visual blockchain explorer. We mm -hmm. like to think of it as a cross between a Google Maps and a Bloomberg terminal. Mm -hmm. and it's general purpose, but we took that architecture and are using it to display the token curated registry smart contracts. Mm -hmm. So it, you have this React app uh, web browser, and we're using OpenStreetMap, Mapbox as a base layer for visualization, as well as some tools from Uber, um, some WebGL tools, one called DeckGL, uh, and you interact it with MetaMask. And then you can push data to Ethereum from the web app. Mm -hmm. And then we have a backend. Uh, RESTful API, uh, an indexer, you know, written in Haskell and running like Kubernetes clusters. So that's actually then indexing the blockchain. Mm -hmm. And then basically just sending standard WebSocket events back to the front end. So there is a, like a latency of block time mm -hmm. for uncle blocks as well. So like we wait six blocks. But then uh, your data from the blockchain will then be rendered on the map. Um, and so it's primarily an Ethereum web application. But all the metadata that you're adding to the point, so you're adding like name, location, phone number, description, uh, different tags, that is pushed and stored on IPFS. And so when you look at the contract on Etherscan of a point, 
um, from that, you can also derive the IPFS hash and you know, see an IPFS, the metadata. Okay, very cool, very cool. So how did you, um, how did you choose those, 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 uh, those underlying blockchains and, and you know, distributed file systems? Were, what was the decision-making process, process, process there? Um, yeah, so from the starting point, we see as Ethereum at the moment as one of the only fully functional smart contract platforms to launch an application. So for us, um, that was a starting point. Um, in terms of the spatial index stack, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're kind of functional programmers uh, here at Foam. Mm -hmm. So the part I left out was the front end aspect is written in a language called PureScript. It's a functional programming language based off Haskell, but it compiles to JavaScript. Mm -hmm. And we are the authors of the PureScript Web3 library and the largest contributor to the Haskell Web3 library. And uh, as an alternative to the Ethereum development tool called Truffle, which is in JavaScript, we made something called Chantrell, uh, which is written in PureScript. And so we have this kind of um, independent to foam, but uh, Ethereum functional programming stack that we which is powering that spatial index. Um, so that was kind of how we decided, you know, the architecture of it. And we actually ran uh, multiple studies of gas costs for storing that metadata on chain, uh, which came out with some interesting results, but ultimately thought it would be too expensive to support that uh, for the users. And so IPFS is probably one of the best options to use instead, but there's still a lot of um, potential issues in like that to make sure the data actually ends up on IPFS and it stays there, for example. Um, we're looking into other things, which hopefully get further along in the next year, like IPNS um, for like a naming service so that you could more easily redirect where your metadata is. So in the case that, you know, the phone number changes or the description changes, you could like easily point to your point to different metadata. Um, but really, it was just the case of us making some of our own architecture tools uh, and libraries and trying to take like what is the most usable in the ecosystem. And I think Ethereum and IPFS are some of the most usable production ready tools. Very cool, very cool. Um, so um, tell me a little bit about these, these radio nodes um, that, that you guys are, are kind of, I guess, maybe developing or, or whatever. There's, there's some hardware infrastructure required fundamentally to replace the satellites that are orbiting the earth, right? You still need some timestamp signals of some kind. You still need, you still need some, some dedicated hardware. This cannot be a software solution over, you know, existing hardware. This, this requires new infrastructure, this mapping system. Um, so the mapping system does not necessarily, and the foam map is live today on Ethereum. You can visit it at map.foam.space. Mm -hmm. The phone protocol is um, designed to provide proof of location, but for us, we divided that into two different types, uh, and that is static proof of location and dynamic proof of location. So by static proof of location, it's things on the map, like, is this thing there? It shouldn't move. It should just be there, and we have a community-driven mechanism to curate that data. Mm -hmm. um, and that's live and production-ready and will be upgraded over time. Uh, the dynamic proof of location is how do we come to consensus on things that actually move around, like a car, a person, or a machine. And that's what we're actively developing now. And the way that we're approaching that is through low power wide area radios and a time synchronization protocol, uh, or more specifically a Byzantine fault tolerant time synchronization protocol, mm -hmm. so that you can have a terrestrial based um, GPS kind of system. And to be part of that system, you have to stake tokens and agree to you know, follow the protocol rules. And from a physics point of view, it's the same um, way that GPS works, that you have at least four nodes, uh, X, Y, Z, and a fourth for time variance, and they synchronize their clocks to a nanosecond precision. And anyone who then can hear those signals can triangulate or rather trilaterate themselves. Uh, and GPS works that way today, and it's really great to figure out where you are, but you can just change that data and send it off to someone else and they have no way to know if that's a real message or a spoofed one because GPS is only one directional. So our protocol um, has an incentive mechanism for people to run these low power radios and operate what we call zones of coverage. Mm -hmm. The radios we refer to as zone anchors. So they kind of anchor down and commit to a service level agreement with tokens to offer time, timing services. And the way it is then different from GPS is that it's not just one directional where if you receive the messages, you can find out where you are. It's bi-directional. And by that, we mean this location customer 
who's hearing the radios about their location can then send a message back and in a cryptographic handshake produce a receipt or produce a proof about that they actually were there, they heard their messages, and then the zone heard it back. Uh, and that's something we don't have today, where when you get your GPS message, you, there's no registry of that you <coughs> received it. Um, you don't talk back to the satellite and have it keep a history of where you've been. So we're offering uh, a new way to make basically fraud-proof cryptographic uh, attestations of where people have been, mm -hmm. um, and using that through a time synchronization protocol over low-power radios. That's interesting. So I guess it would, you know, since since you know how long it takes for the signal to travel from the, the geolocation anchor to your device, and then the anchor knows how long it takes you to respond back. Yeah, they, it's they, time difference of arrival, time of flight, and then with at least four, you can do trilateration. Very, very cool, very cool. So one question that I have is since, since you actually need to build new, well, since you need to build new infrastructure for dynamic location data, um, is there any chance that these, these, these radio wide area networks, um, could they be used to double as, you know, new infra internet infra infrastructure? Like, uh, like, could they be some kind of new distributed mesh network that maybe could also route data, route other forms of data rather than just location? Yeah, it's definitely possible. Uh, we see probably foam working alongside kind of internet mesh net protocols. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the time sync protocol we're working on is radio agnostic. So it could mm -hmm. run on all different kinds of radios. Mm -hmm. But we're looking at these low power ones, and specifically one called the Aurora, um, because they're extremely cheap. They go a really long distance and have a long battery life, but they have really low throughput. So just a kilobytes of data. Mm -hmm. And for our purposes, that makes sense because they're just sending a timestamp and their public key and that mm -hmm. public key takes up about 80% of the message size. So if we go this low power uh, radio route, they can't really be broadcasting internet, but um, because our protocol is radio agnostic and if it was running on a different radio or more powerful one, um, that device- Or a software defined radio. Yeah. yeah. But um, because we're really focused on tackling the location problem and through time syncing head mm -hmm. on, that's mm -hmm. all we're focused on, but we can easily imagine if you're a zone operator in foam, you're also very likely a mesh net operator in Althea or you know, a storage um, files service provider via Filecoin. And it's very likely the market may respond to that and produce you know, boxes or devices that have capabilities uh, to support multiple protocols. Very cool, very, very cool. Um, so um, in terms of future proofing, I mean, do you, do you see any, any issues? I know that, for example, Ethereum, uh, you know, they're, they're going to be releasing a, te a test net supposedly of their, uh, their anchor chain next month to move to, to Ethereum 2.0 and their, their sharded um, kind of Ether platform that they're, and they're moving forward on the roadmap. Is that, is that going to affect you guys in any way? Is that going to help you? Is that going to hurt you? How's that going to, that transition going to work? Um, ideally, it doesn't hurt us. Um, It'd be great if it helps us, but we're kind of not that dependent on uh, ETH 2.0 mm -hmm. in that the dynamic proof of location is kind of its own scaling solution. Mm -hmm. um, and I can unpack that in that, you know, um, out of these BFT kinds of systems, there's really three types, which is uh, synchronous, uh, partially synchronous and asynchronous. Mm -hmm. And proof of location relies on all three. So you have a local zone in one little area and it's running a synchronous BFT time sync protocol where it can determine its own geometry and know when it needs to resync. Um, and in that local zone, they're sharing a state machine. And with that, we're using a tendermint consensus to update that uh, state mm -hmm. machine, which mm -hmm. is a partially synchronous BFT uh, algorithm. So you just have this local blockchain in this local zone uh, running this, but how did they ever get into the system in the first place? It's that they entered through some parent chain or some root chain, call it Ethereum, which is asynchronous. Mm -hmm. And that's where they actually stake tokens and enter into these agreements to basically get the authority to run these local zones. And that's where um, ultimately a verifier will post fraud proofs and where the rewards will be given out on this parent chain. Um, but for our purposes, that parent chain could be Ethereum 1.0 technically, 2.0, but it could also be Cosmos, Affinity, could be a parachain on Polkadot. So that's really like the final piece of the puzzle for us of, of connecting to that parent chain. And we only really need to get there 
when we're really at production level. And we have a lot more work to do on the radios and the local consensus before we uh, are connecting to this parent chain. Okay. And so an ETH 2.0 would definitely help us and would be a very viable option to use. But um, when it gets into the dynamic proof of location, it's really about you know real world scenarios and radio frequencies and it can ultimately you know connect to any blockchain if needed. Right. So, um, okay. Well, I mean, as long as you know it's it's uh, you're not tied to like for example Ethereum 1.0, which which could potentially die in in the next eighteen months or something like that. Um, that's not really an issue. Uh, so the the next question that I have is about the um, the these non fungible tokens um, that you guys are kind of distributing over over foam space. Um, so we understand that you know currency fundamentally is basically just a, a, an instrument, a financial instrument that is used to command labor. So you're you're trying to distribute these non fungible tokens, um, I guess, as a form of currency, like as as a financial incentive to participate in this network. Um, yeah. So. We actually have two different kinds of NFTs. The second might not be so visible. Um, if you take a look at the project, we did a bunch of extrinsic incentive kind of models to participate in the map. Uh -huh. So we're kind of like uh, mapathons. We had one of a holiday treasure hunt where each day we put out a riddle on Twitter uh -huh. about a location. And if you solved the riddle and added that point to the map, you would win this non-fungible token that was a design of that building. So it's kind of a fun way to encourage engagement. And for about each riddle, we got 50 points added to the map, um, which is interesting kind of to know. So out of a 10 day campaign, like 500 points were aggregately added for people guessing, uh, et cetera. And the answer might be Alan Turn's birthplace. And if you added that, you win this non-fungible artwork of the building. So it was kind of a fun experiment to it tests engagement through external incentives. And we did another one uh, last week for an event we held with MakerDAO, Life Here, and Relevant. We gave out an NFT of the building that we work out of to everyone who came. Um, so, and we also got about 50 points added to the map via that. So that, that is um, not meant to be kind of currency, but more like a badge system or like a way to encourage cartographers to you know, add more to the map. Because mm -hmm. it really kind of lacks context at the moment until there are these applications that need to reference it and use it. Um, it's this Web 3.0 map for the sake of it at the moment. Um, so we've used NFTs as this extrinsic kind of reward model. Mm -hmm. But internal to the protocol, we actually utilize NFTs as well. Something I didn't touch on yet is called signaling. Mm -hmm. and signaling is the bridge between static uh, dy and dynamic proof of location. And signaling is currently live today. And what signaling is, is staking tokens not to a point of interest, but to a general area on the map. And mm -hmm. you can decide the radius and how many tokens you want to stake there. And what that signal is a signifier that you want dynamic proof of location to occur there. Mm -hmm. When there is dynamic proof of location, there will be mining rewards. And those mining rewards will be actually spatially weighted by where people are signaling they want this coverage. And once the coverage begins, people can move their signals to areas where no one is, increase the rewards there, and hopefully a miner comes. But from an architectural point of view, the signal itself is an NFT. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how we designed it. So you stake 100 foam tokens in an area or with a radius of one mile in New York City. Um, your signal will be created, and your tokens will be locked in the signal contract, and you'll be issued an NFT of the signal. So everyone who signaled on the map, which is like, you know, hundreds of people actually then got and returned this NFT of the signal. And why is that interesting is because if signals are also weighted by time, um, this NFT of your signal might be more valuable than just the tokens locked in it. And there could be markets for signals in the future. Um, it's just something that we left open from a design point of view. Um, and just architecturally, it made sense to implement signals as NFTs. Um, it's not really about collectibles. It was just more from making a registry of signals and the way to track them. Mm -hmm. So use NFTs or ERC-721 in the signaling contract. And then in terms of like marketing campaigns and user engagement, we've been doing giveaways of collectibles to incentivize participating in the map. Okay. But I mean, these, these collectibles are, are basically just for enthusiasts that, that are, are interested in, in collecting, um, like basically street cred as cartographers, 
right? You don't, do you envision that these non-fungible tokens could ever be used to purchase goods and services in, in, by the wider community? Um, that's not really part of the vision or not necessarily our intention, mm -hmm. but those NFTs are already listed on OpenSea, which is an NFT marketplace. And because it is a you know, beautiful piece of artwork of a nice building, mm -hmm. there is already a marketplace, so you could make a bid on them yourself right now. So right. we could see people you know, cashing in, let's say, on their cartographer achievements, mm -hmm. um, but more like as a one-time thing. I don't believe those badges would be accepted by businesses, but that would be great if they were. Right, right. Um, I guess my next question is, since, since this is essentially a censorship resistant mapping system, right? Um, that is decentralized and completely open and, and very difficult for any central authority to interfere with. What is your view of, you know, the, the, um, the applications in, in journalism or, or, you know, the human rights applications of, of this kind of technology. Like, like, for example, we know that certain countries might have, uh, you know, prison camps in certain regions um, that are actually visible on Google Earth, but that they, they either deny or, or they, they call, you know, vocational training centers. But when you go up close, you can see guard towers and barbed wire and stuff like that. So, but these 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 locations, for obvious reasons, would be remote and and you know obviously very far away from any kind of um, radio anchor infrastructure that you might put in place, and and they might not necessarily, I mean, they they might be kind of out of the way. So how would you how would your system um, maybe help with some of those issues? Um, well. Like you said, it's censorship resistant, so anybody can add anything they want to the map. Mm -hmm. And we've already seen some interesting things play out in the South China Sea with territorial disputes. Mm -hmm. so there's a disputed island between Japan and Korea that has like upwards of 10 POIs that were deleted and kicked off because they, according to the challenger, incorrectly said it was Korean or vice versa, Japan. Mm -hmm. And the point that eventually wound up surviving is one that is a very diplomatic <laughs> basically says that the island belongs to both. Um, so you can easily you know, call attention to things on the map and even stake a lot of tokens to give it more attention to um, either a territorial dispute or a you know, extrajudicial site where you know, something is maybe occurring that you think the world should know about. Mm -hmm. The flip side is that at the moment, you know, all of these systems uh, could tend towards plutocracy and uh, you, know, you could also essentially censor information by having a large amount of tokens because you can also challenge points and kick them off. And so at these stages, I think that, you know, having a really active and devoted community that can be vigilant and, you know, see if a suspicious, you know, account with a large amount of tokens is trying to start a challenge on some potentially controversial point. Mm -hmm. and we're working on <clears throat> providing those tools that you can actually track reputation and see, you know, if this person's challenging things, uh, just to try to get the money or if they have real reasons. And we're launching next week a leaderboard. Mm -hmm. So there you can easily see how many points people have added, how many challenges they've initiated, how many votes they've participated in, and also how many tokens they've won through the process. And tools like that will become more robust and hopefully you'll be able to combat someone with a large amount of tokens trying to act malicious. Mm -hmm. um, but on the flip side, yeah, because it is censorship resistant off the bat, you can only really be censored by someone putting tokens against you to try to kick you off, but you can easily bring attention to um, controversial geodata, but also we see a lot of unique places that maybe have sentimental value or a very interesting description on our map that wouldn't ever be on Google Maps as well. Interesting, interesting. So, uh, but I mean, is there not any way to use um, kind of third party, um, I don't know, like, like for example, uh, you know, when it comes to these contentious islands, like, like the, 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 you know, the islands that are disputed between China and Korea, or the islands that are disputed between China and Japan, or some of these new artificial islands that are encroaching on the, um, the, the, you know, fishing rights and and mineral extraction rights of very poor countries like Vietnam and the Philippines. I mean, is there not any way that we can? 
we can uh, not necessarily allow someone with more tokens to to buy the truth, but rather use, um, you know, international law as as a point of contention as well. Like, hang on, here's what uh, here's what an international tribunal has said about the nine dot line in in the nine the nine dash line in the South China Sea, for example, right? Like, uh, I mean, cartographers have every right to appeal to authority, and we've already. Yeah so far. So for example, someone added a cannabis club in Barcelona mm -hmm. and all the information was correct, phone number, website, mm -hmm. and someone challenged it saying it's illegal in Spain to advertise cannabis industries. Okay. That then became a debate in our community because people in our community saying, who cares what the law is in Spain? This is a real place that can stay on the map. Mm -hmm. And uh, it actually got voted off. Um, and so that's a case where someone was appealing to some sort of law of a sovereign nation mm -hmm. as a way to try to sway the community to vote in their favor. Um, I personally think the point should have stayed because it's a real location and it's on the blockchain map. Um, but it's really about taking your case to the community. So we have a message board where people debate challenges and you can, when you start a challenge, you can put in a description. Or if you think it's a controversial part to begin in the description, you could link to whatever you would like to kind of make your case. Mm -hmm. um, or some people go about it a different way. We have one community member that actually films himself at every point he goes to. <laughs> um, he's mostly doing Route 66 through the middle of America. Okay. Um, and it's fun that he's creating that content, but when you really asked him, you know, why are you doing this? He said, if anyone challenges me, I have all the evidence I was there and I can take my case to the community. So you could, you know, use your own evidence or appeals to authority um, through uh, community engagement. And anytime there is a vote at the moment, there's a five day window to participate. So there's a decent amount of time to actually have a discussion or evaluate. And the voting process uses partial lock commit reveal, uh, which is a pretty clunky process. But what it, one thing it gives you is that you can't see how many people have voted in which direction until it's over. So it's difficult to like follow the crowd and we have seen actual debate occur, which is interesting to see. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, you know that 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 um, an authority with with a little bit more money or you know maybe a little bit more incentive to motivate for example like like in uh, in china there's this kind of running joke that they have a, a 50 cent army um which is essentially like uh you know a hundred thousand up to upwards of a million people that actually get paid to uh, to to comment on or or you know um, dispute various um, micro blog posts on Weibo, which is the Chinese Twitter or something like that. So anyone with with a lot of that, that is able to mobilize a lot a large number of participants would essentially be able to control what should be an uncensorable uh, truth, right? About mapping data. So is there any way to keep data that's been voted off? Um, in your view to just say this, this data was here, someone did make this, but it lost a vote, it was deemed yeah, illegitimate so or? We have um, layers on the map. Mm -hmm. and like when a new point is added, it's blue, which means it's pending to give people the indication they should maybe inspect it. Uh, mm -hmm. Green means it's on the registry and mm -hmm. it's part of the map and red means it's currently, or it's rather pink means it's currently challenged. Uh, we have a fourth layer, which is like the graveyard. Um, which is like a blood red and you can turn on that one and see all the points that were removed um, and you can also see why what was the challenge reason and some of them they look really legit so that you yourself could you know just re-add it or you know bring it up to other people to have them re-add it but it is currently possible to look at all the points that were removed uh, so they still exist on the blockchain so to speak mm -hmm. but uh, they're an invalid point so they don't they're not part of the registry right but so there's, there is a possibility then that you might end up with with forks that have different consensus mechanisms based on different you know standards of truth or whatever you might yeah. end up um, our code is open source like uh, other ones so someone could fork it and make a different uh smart contract logic mm -hmm. alternatively um we are interface facilitators you know hosting the map and paying the aws bills someone else could make a different interface that you know uses Google Maps even mm -hmm. <laughs> if you wanted to pay for it and display the phone map data there and choose different layers which would, could augment the user experience in a different way. Wow. Uh, and yeah, uh, I think that the problem exists for most blockchain projects that someone with enough 
willpower and money can you know coordinate bad actors to interrupt your protocol right right very cool very cool so um i mean it's definitely a very interesting project i'm uh I, I've I've asked most of the questions that I had about it. Was there anything else that you wanted to bring up? Um, yeah, I would just say for anyone, thanks for tuning in. But you, if you are interested in the ideas we've been discussing, the foam map is currently live. You can mm -hmm. access it at map.foam.space. Mm -hmm. um, probably Uniswap is the easiest way to get a few tokens to if you want to play around with it. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a developer, we have a developer portal, uh, developer.foam.space, with access to our API and tooling. If you mm -hmm. want to build your own mapping application, uh, please get in touch. And yeah, we're a full force ahead on working on the radio and the timestamp protocol. So we'll be releasing updates uh, over the next months. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I, hope to, uh, I hope to see how the progress goes. I hope it, it really takes off because as you mentioned, there are some, some very obvious issues with, with the incumbent uh, competitors in that space. Yeah. Um, maybe for not for the sake of the podcast, but you could give me a bit of background on yourself or what you're up to. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, um, I actually spent, um, 12 years in, in mainland China. So, um, I'm very interested in, you know, I, I was building kind of censorship resistant content distribution networks. I was trying to use, you know, um, ubiquitous protocols that would be extremely damaging to, to censor such as IMAP um, or, or things like, uh, like BitTorrent um, because they rely on very, very popular distributed hash tables for addressing content, right? So when you're talking about a hash table that has maybe 20 million nodes running dynamic IP addresses, that's very hard to write a firewall rule to exclude all of those constantly changing dynamic IP addresses. So I'm very interested, my primary interest in this space is, is really the censorship resistant aspect of, of distributed systems and, and how um, these technologies can be used uh, to enhance you know, various uh, human rights issues around the world, not only in China, but in most of the Middle East and, and, and you know, various parts of Eurasia. Um, where the internet is censored or controlled um, and, and, you know, um, any technology that allows people to share a consistent view of history, which is essentially what block, blockchain does, right? It's, it's basically just time-stamped, time crypt, cryptographically signed data that allows people to share a consistent view of historical truth, right? So I find that, that, you know, viewing this technology fundamentally just as, um, you know, fintech for, for money is, is a bit short-sighted because it goes, I mean, the rabbit hole goes way deeper than that in my view. Um, this technology is, is far more powerful and, and far more beneficial um, than that. And it's, you know, it's not just about laundering money and selling drugs on, uh, on, on Silk Road and stuff like that. It goes, it goes, um, there's, there's a lot of use cases that, um, that I think, you know, have the potential to eliminate a lot of um, corruption by adding transparency, um, by, by giving people a, a, a bigger voice. So when it comes to, you know, all of the applications that you talk about involving proof of location. I mean, I can definitely see how that would be extremely useful for, uh, for various types of human rights, human rights activists and journalists. Right. So that's, that's kind of why, why I'm interested in this technology. That's my primary um, angle on, on covering all of these, these new systems. Yeah. Cool. Very interesting. Yeah. Cool. So uh, again, thank you for your time. Uh, I hope we can uh, keep in touch and um, that you'll let me know how your progress is going. I'm, I, like I said, I'm, I'm really interested in this, um, especially, you know, if you guys can, can kind of make it, you know, balance it out so that there's no, there's no way that a state level actor can just buy coordinates off a map or, or, you know, kind of, uh, cause that's, that's a, that's a major threat. I, I guess to the integrity of, of, of the map is, you know, it's still, 
it's still not necessarily it it can be censored through various economic means still so that's that's kind of a threat that i see to to what you guys are doing but it's it's still the underlying technology is pretty rock solid and it's it's very cool technology yeah great well thanks for having me and please let me know and uh it's uploaded and we can share in our networks absolutely yeah that's that's what i'll do i'll send you the link as soon as i upload it okay great okay uh, thank you